Morning everybody, 2 Peter chapter three is where we're gonna be. My name is Ross Lester, I'm the campus pastor at West and part of the preaching team here at the Austin Stone and I just consider it a weighty and immense privilege to be with you here this morning. We spent um, over a year in 1 Peter, going verse by verse, line by line, then we thought we'd speed it up a little bit as we headed to 2 Peter and so we spent three weeks in 2 Peter just going chapter by chapter looking at the big themes of Peter's second letter to the diaspora, the scattered church in the first century. Let me just recap where we've been, then we're gonna dive right into an amazing text this morning. In week one, we studied chapter one in which Peter said some amazing things. He said, don't shrink back from new life in Christ, grow in grace. The Christian life isn't supposed to just be a get out of hell free card, then live however you want, and then hope it all works out at the last day. The Christian life is a new life, and here's the good news, you have everything that you need for that new life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the good news from Peter was, hey, you've got a new life in following Jesus Christ, but as you know Jesus Christ, everything that you need in order to be able to walk that new life out is already given to you. In week two, Harlem looked at chapter two and it was Peter's stern but gracious and caring warning to the church um, from that chapter. God in his kindness, mercy and grace warned the church that, hey guys, be careful how you live. Don't just think you can live any old way. Why? Judgment day is still coming and we will all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and make sure you don't heed the calls of the false prophets who are coming along saying, it doesn't matter after salvation how you live in the flesh because Jesus wasn't really bodily resurrected and isn't really gonna bodily return and so what you do in your body doesn't matter because your soul is gonna be spared in the end. That's what the false teachers were saying. And, And Peter was like, no, no, guys, remember, judgment day, a bodily Jesus Christ will be there and so it does matter. So today we're gonna say, okay, well what will that judgment day be like and why on earth is it taking so long? Because as we read the text, Peter was persuaded it was imminent, right? This thing's just around the corner. It could happen any day. And when you read the New Testament writers, they'll refer again and again to the last days. They didn't have in their mind some future time when there were satanic lyrics hidden in pop songs um, and, and you know those sorts of things where someone with a chart could predict that those were the last days. They thought they were in the last days. It's this entire era the last 2,000 years, from Christ's ascension all the way through to now, that is the last days. And so they were right to call it that then, we're right to call it that now. But why? Why all the waiting? Why isn't this thing over yet? Have you ever waited for a long time for something and then after a long time just kind of given up on it and then just made some compromises and gone, well, it's never really gonna come to fruition? That's what the church was doing. Uh, We do that, we wait a long time for a good and godly relationship. Oh, if only someone would come along who would love Jesus and love me. And then that kind of perfect combination seems quite difficult to fill after a while. And so we give up and we settle for casual dating with people who don't love Jesus or love us. Don't nod if you're sitting with your significant other. Um, It will lead to an awkward conversation, although perhaps necessary one, in the car on the way home. Or what about results from changed behavior? We, we make decisions to change our behavior and then we want instant results. I decided to get fit and strong this year, can you tell? Um, and uh, and I, I was just hoping for instant results. And so for weeks, just been eating kale and seaweed um, and going to the gym like weekly. Um, and, and just got home yesterday, stood on the scale, looked in the mirror, I was like, I'm still fat, right? And so what did I do? I ate like 9,000 calories worth of chips and guacamole, all right? Because you just kind of, you give up. You go, well, I was waiting for that and it hasn't really materialized. What about reward, rewards in our working life? Some of you have been working really, really hard and your boss doesn't just recognize your genius and promote you up through the ranks. You feel like you're getting bypassed. And so what do people do? They just give up and they say, well, I'll just be a regular nine to fiver then. You'll get the bare minimum out of me because it seems futile. When I was younger, much younger, I was in a band, like a real band, a rock and roll band in South Africa, which is hard for you to compute, I know, okay? But there was rock and roll in Wakanda, okay? And so uh, we, we were in this, in this amazing band and we, we were 
good. Well, I thought so. Um, and we were ruggedly handsome. We had everything going for us. Not everyone agreed with that summation, but, but, but we loved this band. And we gave our lives to it. It was like the summer of 69, right? We played till our fingers bled um, and all of those good things. And we practiced every day, gigged every night, handed out flyers. It's before the internet, right? Really kind of catches on. So you're giving people pieces of paper, inviting them to a venue, um, which was an amazing thing. And it worked. And we started getting popularity and in that tiny market I understand we were kind of a big deal for a moment in time but we wanted to break into this market the American market and we wanted that little nudge that would come and we were just waiting for that big break and months passed and years passed and after a while you just become less persuaded that it's going to happen and so what did we do we just stopped caring We rehearsed less, and we groomed ourselves less, and we promoted gigs less, and we pursued success less and less. Hey, if it worked for all of the grunge bands, we thought, hey, it might work for us. No, okay, the wrong generation again. (laughs) Grunge was a thing um, in the 90s. It was amazing, it was basically a philosophy that people said, if you don't practice and never wash your clothes, you're gonna be world famous, and it worked. Um, But it didn't work for us, and so what happened? The thing kind of petered out, why? We had this delayed hope which the scripture says makes your soul grow sick because we were, we were hoping that this thing would go to the next level and when it didn't, we just kind of backed away from it because it was too hard to just keep pressing in that direction. Now imagine the first century church. Imagine the first readers of Peter's letter. They weren't like us in, in the middle of some kind of Western evangelicalism. Their lives were turned upside down by salvation. They didn't just put their hand up or walk an aisle or sign a card. They, they risked their lives to be a follower of Christ. They joined what their families believe was an insane and dangerous cult and it was costing them everything. It was costing them relationships. It was costing them their finances. It was costing them their jobs. They, they had um, cut massive areas of their life out because they said, well, that's not holy behavior and so we won't engage in that anymore. And now persecution under the narcissistic Nero is starting to press and it's It's costing them a great deal. And a big part of what kept the early church going was this, the promise that said, don't worry. These are the last days and Jesus is coming again soon. And when he does, he's gonna find us righteous and he's gonna judge those who currently are unrighteous and he will bring an eternal kingdom with him where we will reign together forever. And they were like, okay, oh, that sounds, that sounds good. And then a year passed. And then a decade passed, and then another decade passed, and then three by the time this letter's in circulation. And when they're reading this, the apostolic generation, the one who had made this promise to them, the eyewitnesses of this account, they were now starting to die. And they were going like, how how long do we wait for this? This following Jesus thing is hard. How, How long do we wait for him to return? They thought God was being slow in his appearing. And in the middle of that slowness, Peter writes, and in so doing, he's gonna teach us what to do with the slowness of God in in the return of his son, even today. You guys okay? Everyone ready? Let's go, verse one. This is now the second, this is Peter writing, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. I love that redundancy in that sentence. He's like, I want you to be clear, there will be some scoffing that goes on from the scoffers, because scoffers scoff. And so when you see scoffing, you know you have scoffers. It's a sure sign, all right? following their own sinful desires. That's what they were known for. They were saying, hey, holiness, that sounds like hard work. And Jesus probably isn't coming back, guys, so why don't we just bail on the holiness thing, right? Their church was growing, because that's an appealing message. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, that's wonderful euphemism for shuffling off this mortal coil and and going to be um, uh, with Jesus for dying. All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Now Peter's saying, hey, there's some dangerous people in the church and they believe some stuff and they've given into faithlessness. And so the first observation is this, God's slowness is not an excuse for our faithlessness. 
his slowness in, in delaying the return of his son is not an excuse for us to grow in faithlessness like these people were. Now, Peter is referring to a literal, historic Christian belief that is central that Jesus will actually physically and bodily return to the earth. Now, stop for a sec. I just wanna disarm us a little bit. Christians believe some crazy stuff. Crazy stuff, and I'm not even talking about philosophical stuff, I'm talking about historical stuff. Where we believe that Jesus really came to the earth, that he was really born from a virgin, that he really lived, that he really performed miracles, that he really died and it was really in our place, and that he really rose from the dead, that he really appeared to hundreds of eyewitnesses, and that he really ascended to heaven, and that he really promised to be right back. We believe those things, not in a metaphorical, allegorical way. These are literal claims that we hang our hat on. And so to be a follower of Christ is to believe these things, first and foremost. Look at Acts 1, because this promise is part of it. Acts 1 verse 9. And when he had said these things, this is the resurrected Christ. And just by the way, go read Matthew 28. Not everyone believes in the resurrected Christ. If you're someone going, I just need a sign. They had a dead guy come alive and some of them are like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. Seriously, so some of them doubted. They're like, yeah, I don't think so. I've seen, I've seen David Blaine do some similar things and uh, I'm just not sure, right? And so we're gonna need to have faith, but now here he is and he's been with them and he's eaten with them. It's been marvelous. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took them out of their, uh, out of their sight, uh, him out of their sight. I, I like to just kind of picture what this was like. Did he like raise a leg or like... <laughs> Like, I don't know, but it must have been awesome. And he starts to lift off of the ground and this cloud surrounds him and he's gone. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Now the day's been weird already. It's just, it's getting weirder still. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? They're like, well, where do we begin, right? It's been a strange day. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so then they waited because it was promised. I imagine some of them waited on the spot for quite a long time. They were like, he's coming back. They were like, excellent, all right. What time you got there? It's daylight saving, so I'm not, I, I get confused. This whole thing is gonna ruin the world. Why do we do this? I don't know, all right. And they stood there waiting, watching the sky, and then eventually, like, you know, Larry was like, I gotta go work. And they're like, no, that's fair, All right? And off he goes and eventually they disband, hours pass and then days pass and then months pass. And for the first while, every time a bird flies overhead, they're like, he's here, all right? But then after a while, they stop looking at the sky and they stop living with that urgency and that intensity of the fact that Christ would be right back. But Peter is saying to this church, guys, I saw it with my own eyes. You're questioning my integrity, my eyewitness account. He said he was coming back and we believe he is coming back soon. And so he says, don't be alarmed by the scoffers. They were always gonna come. They were always gonna rise up. I saw this with my own eyes. They're gonna try to draw you to faithlessness. What does their faithlessness look like? Mockery, lawless living, and seeing the observable natural order as the ultimate reality. Let's look at these three, three things quickly. We're gonna find we're like the scoffers in some ways. The first is they did scoffing, right? Because they were scoffers. And so they were mocking and belittling those of the faith. It isn't just doubt, it's active opposition meant to cause shame. They were mocking Christians who were making sacrifice in their life, living with holiness, storing up treasures in heaven. And in some sense, friends, listen, there is logic to that mockery. Because if Jesus isn't coming again, there is very little motivation to follow his commandments. And let's be honest, his commandments are counter-cultural, counter-intuitive, and, counter and difficult to follow. Part of what drives us to following them is he's coming back. He's coming back, he's alive, even to this day, he's coming back. Even Paul says to the church in Corinth, guys, if he didn't rise from the dead, we're the dumbest group of people anywhere in the city today. We should be breaking all 10 commandments at South by Southwest right now, <laughs> right now. But he's alive, so we're not, we're not, we're not, <laughs> right? We're not. Why? He's alive and he's coming back. I mean. 
Why else would we follow these instructions? Jesus goes, hey, be pious, be pure in a generation that's defiled. Why would I do that? Or forgive others. Well, how much? A lot. Oh, I don't want to, but he's alive. Someone slaps you, let them do it again. What? Why would I do that? He's alive. He's coming back. Don't even consider sexual immorality, but I want to. In fact, draw the line of adultery so far behind you that it goes all the way to a lustful glance. Oh, goodness, really? Why would I draw it there? Because he's alive and he's coming back. Give to everyone who asks of you. Well, what if they don't deserve it? Doesn't matter. I'm alive and I'm returning. Friends, not many of you will be active scoffers on this issue. Maybe some of you are. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you got, you got dragged here, some kind of weird blind date gone wrong, right? And you're like, <laughs> gosh, she is gorgeous, but I'm starting to wonder if this is worth it, right? But hang with me. And you don't believe at all that Jesus is returning and you find the whole idea ridiculous. I'm hoping, I'm really glad you're here, by the way, and I'm hoping and praying um, that Jesus changes your mind. But many of us would say here today, oh no, I believe that. I believe that, but truth be told, we actually live like the scoffers. We actually live um, in a way as if we don't believe it. We need to hear from Peter that we shouldn't be backing away from radical obedience to Jesus Christ in the face of scoffers. He promises they will come. Many of us aren't really living in the way of Jesus because we know it will invite mockery from people who don't anticipate his return and mockery is the one thing we cannot stand. Secondly, they gave in to lawless living. They were known for licentiousness, for sexual immorality, for rejection of authority. Well, why? Well, I was reminded this week of something that Dostoevsky said in the Brothers Karamazov. Now, that makes me sound smarter than I am, so let me just, I gotta keep a clear conscience while I preach, all right? I wasn't sitting in a leather chair this week smoking a pipe reading Dostoevsky. <laughs> John Dansby, our North Campus pastor, no, our St. John Campus pastor, sorry, I'm new, all right? And so our St. John's Campus pastor put a Dostoevsky quote in his sermon notes and I was like, I'm stealing that, all right? That's much easier than me having to read the whole of that book because that book looks long, all right? And so, but I'm told by John Dansby that Dostoevsky says, <laughs> but I'm honest, right? If God does not exist, everything is permitted. Dostoevsky said that, and it's true. As we discovered last week, these scoffers, these mockers, these false teachers, they live with immorality, why? They don't think there's a final day when they'll stand before Jesus face to face in all his holiness and all his kindness, so they go, well, what's the big deal? Friends, how many of us are giving in to the lawlessness in these same areas because we aren't waiting well in holiness? At some level, we have stopped considering the return of Christ or maybe even stop believing it in it as an imminent reality. I struggle to say yes to sin when I consider standing before my Lord. <laughs> and so to say yes to sin, I have to put that out of my mind and live in faithlessness like the scoffers. Lastly, they had a lack of belief that God can intervene in the natural order. They said, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. This is actually a very modern and very current argument for rejecting the supernatural bodily return um, of Jesus Christ. Essentially says, hey, nature is a closed system and God got the ball rolling to be sure, but it's not open to intervention by an outside body. The sun rises, the sun sets, seasons come, seasons go, science observes, the patterns, dictates the rules, and those rules cannot be broken. And so therefore, the celestial bodies cannot be burned up in an instant, the skies cannot be rolled up like a scroll, and a very much dead man cannot return very much alive. You can't intervene in the natural order. Friends, many of us live like this. In a functional atheism of sorts, we want the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, but we also believe that God kind of has his hands off of the world and no longer sticks his hands into it. We believe only what we observe. And even if we believe in a God who is over all of it, we don't really think he'll burst into the middle of it. Now listen, I'm a good theology guy. I love it. I've got lots, to, lots of learning to do in this space. I wanna warn us though. If our good theology doesn't have space, desire, and anticipation that God could and can, does and can break into the natural order. If our good theology 
doesn't have space, desire, and anticipation that God can and does break into the natural order to do something supernatural, then it isn't good theology. And we aren't waiting well. I hope and pray we won't be like the faithless scoffers, going like, nah, God doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does the impossible, he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he rescues the orphan, he provides for our needs. Don't walk out of functional atheism, friends. That is the most joyless way to live. Don't be like the scoffers. All right, verse five. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Here's Peter's argument in three steps. At the beginning there was nothing, then God spoke and there was something. He creates ex nihilo and so it's his and so he can do with it exactly as he pleases. At the time of the great flood, there was wickedness and he spoke and there was a flood and there was judgment and a purging of the earth. Therefore, if he speaks again, he can roll up the skies like a scroll and burn up the heavenly bodies. He can do that. It's his prerogative. He will purify the earth again, not through flood, because he promised not to do that, but through fire. It's his. It's his. Verse eight. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Second observation, God's slowness is actually God's patience. And so his slowness shouldn't lead us to a lawlessness because his slowness is actually his patience. Now listen, trying to speak of God in temporary terms is so difficult because he's outside of it. There's the rather complex concept that God's understanding of time must be totally different from ours. Why? He's not bound by it. And so things that feel long to us in comparison to eternity are like a moment to one who exists outside of time and in authority over all time. But I can't just leave you with that and go like, whoa, that was amazing, bro. Foolish, wow, let's eat some kale salad and it'll be cool, you know? How how can we actually get our heads around this? I think even in our fallenness, God gives us some access to this concept. Have you noticed how the older you get, the faster time seems to go? Okay, don't nod your head if you're 20 something, okay? (laughs) It It hasn't happened yet, we need you in the world. You're smart and we love you, okay? But something happens north of 30, it's just like someone just presses like the double speed thing, all right? And everything just starts to go, and you're like, hey, hey! Because you know you're being ushered rapidly, increasingly rapidly towards your death. Um, And so (laughs) it's a a weird thing, it goes fast, right? And so uh, this is a bit of what it's like. I had my 20 year high school reunion two years ago. I know, it's alarming. And we went back and we we're all trying to be cool, but like we weren't cool then, we aren't cool now. And we walked around the school like courtyard. We had it at the school, which was like so traumatic, right? Like I was just filled with angst the second I, I stepped on the property. Will she like me? Sue's like, we've been married for 10 years. Why do you care? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, do I look all right? She's like, no, you look middle-aged. Like just go and just, just enjoy it. But it felt when I was walking through those halls like I was there yesterday, like I was there the day before. I can remember my moments of existential crisis, right? Walking outside a geography class, it felt like I was just there. And yet I was like, not just there. I was 20 years ago. It's crazy. My son Daniel, he's seven. I feel like he was born yesterday. I'm turning 40 next year. I can clearly remember a time when I could see my abs. It feels like yesterday, but I assure you, it wasn't, all right? Or the day before that, it's so weird. Now imagine an eternal God who has all of eternity in mind at once and can see it all at once. If a thousand years is like a day to the Lord, then Jesus was here two days ago. (laughs) What's the big deal? Okay, 
But why does it feel to us like he's taking so long? Well, Peter tells us because of his patience, that's why. He is patiently gathering in the full number of those appointed to salvation that we're told about in Romans 11:25. that not one that he is called by name will perish and he is waiting until that number is complete and he won't return until he has them all, but then he will come and like a thief. Now what's that about a thief? You don't expect them, right? Otherwise they wouldn't be a very good thief. It's like, I punched you in the face and you left and you didn't steal my stuff, right? Because I knew you were coming. But a thief uses stealth. And they sneak, that's how God's gonna come back, but he will come back. In the meanwhile, he's patiently gathering his elect and building up his church. Friends, this is why God's slowness is really good news to us. There are many days when I'm mad that he hasn't come back yet, but then I think of my kids and my friends who I'm trying to share the gospel with. I think of my family members who don't yet know him. I think of people who I love who haven't yet repented, and I'm thankful for his patience. Jesus saved me in 1986. I'm really glad he didn't come back in 1985. His patience, his patience. Let's be people who thank God for his patience and then let's be people who know that he'll arrive like a thief. So let's be patient and urgent at the same time. Can we be those two things? Patient with the Lord because he's patient with us, urgent in sharing the gospel and living lives of radical sacrifice back towards him. All right, verse 11, I'm nearly done. Since all these things, that's everything, the earth, the heavenly bodies, are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Third observation is this. God's slowness should lead us to a separation from the world. He says, well, what kind of people are you gonna be? Well, we're gonna be a people who live for that next world. That's how this argument goes full circle again. How should we live while we wait? Well, as foreigners and as aliens, not as long-term residents, as freaks of holiness and humility who refuse to settle for the rewards of this life because our eyes are on a different horizon because we are sure that that day is coming. Sue hates it when I preach messages like this because it means that we have to do an audit on our lives. So she's like, what are you preaching? I was like, Second Peter 3. She's like, oh, are we gonna do the audit thing? Do our lives make sense in light of the return of Christ? I'm like, you bet. She's like, can't I give you another text? I was like, no, God's sovereignty and, and providence. And so seriously, over the last few weeks, just sitting again and just going, my goodness. Am I living like this is all gonna be purged by fire? If this is all gonna go through the, refires, the refiner's fire, does my life make sense? Well, I'm gonna be standing with hands full of ashes going, oh, (laughs) really shouldn't have given so much to those things because look how they burned up. What will make it through the fire? Only things that matter in heaven will last. And so only those things we should live for. Holiness, oh yeah. Godliness, yep. Radical generosity, yes. Gentleness, yes. Kindness, yes. Sacrifice, yes. Evangelism, yes. Yes, yes. Following Christ with our whole hearts, yes. Godliness matters. And it'll matter in the new heavens and the new earth. So much of the rest of it doesn't. When Sue and I made the decision to move to Austin about a year ago, we had to pack up our lives in Johannesburg, everything that we had known, 38 years of living in one city. And we sold our house really quick and so we ended up living with her parents for a few months, which was... Um, superawkward.com, um, but it was, uh, it was actually one of the most helpful seasons in our life. You know why? When you know you won't be somewhere for long, you live with a freedom and a joy and a purpose in everything that you do, in everything that you spend, in everything that you stress over because you know you're not gonna be there for long. And so you know what we didn't do? Buy a bunch of stuff we didn't need, why? We were just gonna have to ship it across with us and so we were liberated from that. You know what we did do? Gave away a bunch of stuff we didn't need. Why? Because we knew we didn't need it, we couldn't keep it. You know what we did do? We prioritized time with people that we loved. Instead of just saying, hey, we should get dinner, we got dinner. I mean, most of your adult life is just gonna be looking people you love in the eye and say, we should get dinner sometime and just doing that again and again, again and again till you're all dead. And no one's had dinner. We said, what if we actually did this? This would be crazy. 
And so we knew we only had a few months with people we loved and so we spent precious time with them. We put our devices away and looked them in the eye and had adult conversations. It was astonishing. There's a way in which we're all supposed to be living like this because our eyes on another horizon. Friend, how much of what currently really stresses you out will matter in the new heavens and the new earth? How much of what you're currently sacrificing for will endure the fire? How much of what you currently want now will you want then? Live for things that don't burn easily. Let's live lives of holiness and godliness and contentment that wait for and hasten the day of the Lord. There's a great song by a band I love called Thrice. Their lead singer is uh, Dustin Kensrue. And in fact, I want this song played at my memorial service. Um, seriously, this and one other song called Somewhere I Belong by Switchfoot. And it troubled me in the nine and it's troubling me in the 11.15 that no one is writing this down, because I'm serious. <laughs> I need you to remember that when I die, this is my grand plan. At the end of the service, they're gonna play In Exile by Thrice and Somewhere I Belong by Switchfoot with pictures of me scrolling on the screens and people are gonna get saved, okay? And so uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important. But In Exile has become a bit of a, a theme song for me. Why? It speaks about this, this living for the next life. Look, look at these lyrics. I am an exile, a sojourner, a citizen of some other place. Well, I've seen as just a glimmer in a shadowy mirror, but I know one day I'll see face to face. I am a nomad, a wanderer. I have nowhere to lay my head down. There's no point in putting roots too deep when I'm moving on. I'm not settling for this unsettling town. My heart is full with songs of forever, of a city that endures when all is made new. I know I don't belong here. I'll never call this place my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a pilgrim, a voyager. I won't rest until my lips touch the shore of the land that I've been longing for as long as I've lived, where there'll be no pain or tears anymore. My heart is filled with songs of forever, of a city that endures where all is made new. I know I don't belong here, so I'll never call this place my home. I'm just passing through. Let me land this plane, verse 13. And so the slowness of God shouldn't lead to lawlessness. The, the, the slowness of God is actually his patience and the slowness of God should drive us to holiness and a separation from this world. And then verse 13 says, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens <laughs> and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Oh, last observation. God's slowness will be worth the wait. It'll be worth the wait. It's not just about what we will lose when things are burned up. Look at what we will gain. A new heaven, a new earth, new bodies. And we know from scripture that that will be fantastic. The world as it should be, full of righteousness, full of peace, full of justice. And we will stand before our Lord. And listen, if you are in Christ, you will stand before your Lord without spot or blemish. Have you thought of that? I always used to think, I don't know where I got it from, maybe a bad Christian movie. Um, again, redundancy. Um, but uh, <laughs> maybe this is where I got it from. But I always thought when I stood before Jesus, there was gonna be a huge screen and they were gonna play out all the nasty stuff that I did in secret and thought. And I was gonna stand there in a horror and then Jesus was gonna go, oh, but you get in anyway. And I was gonna be like, well, I don't really wanna come in now. Everyone knows, right? <laughs> but when we hear of Judgment Day, it speaks of us being found without spot or blemish. Hey, I stand in the line, I get there. Father goes, righteous in my son. Brilliant, no spot, no blemish. Come on into your rest, good and faithful servant. Like I wasn't that good or that faithful. Yeah, but he was, come on in. Come on, what a day. But for those who aren't in Christ on that day, you'll be standing there with burnt up ashes going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I wish I'd known. It may be a day from now, It may be a thousand years. It's all the same for God. We ought to grab every day with a zeal for radical obedience and a deep desire to live out the fact that he makes us righteous through his son. Let's live in a way 
that shows that we're in peace, at peace with that righteousness and ready for our great king to come and get us. Friends, the king, the king is coming. Will he find his bride ready and waiting and eager for that day? The heavens will be rolled up like a scroll and the celestial bodies and every material thing we fought for in this world will be purged by fire and they'll just be him and an eternity with him. What a day that will be. Let's live ready. I wanna pray, I'm gonna invite the band up. Um, And as I pray, I want us this morning actually just to consider, because I think, I think a text like that deserves a response. I think what can happen is we can get so caught up in just Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Sunday and we hear the word preached and the word is powerful and we go like, yeah, no, that's, that's true and we just kind of tick it off. Then we leave here and none of it actually takes hold. Sometimes we've got to stop and go like, my goodness, if that is true, then dot, dot, dot. And so I want to pray for you. But ask that question. If that's true, then what needs to change? For some of you, you need to come to faith this morning. You've been sitting on the fence and for some reason you're just persuaded now this morning that Jesus rose from the dead. That's called salvation. (laughs) Trust him, say, Lord, I I believe in you and I believe you're coming back. Help me, help me, save me. He will, he will. Some of you have been living a life like the scoffers that Peter wrote to at some level, assenting to the fact, oh yes, he'll return, but there'll be another day for repentance. No, today's the day. No, today's the day. Picture yourself without spot or blemish on that great day and live towards that day now. Father God, we come before you. Um, We love you. We're grateful for your word. I wanna pray now in this moment, for those in the room who don't know you. I'm sure they've still got tons of questions, but I think some of them would be feeling just drawn towards you. I pray that you would give them the the grace and the faith and the wisdom to just press in. Just keep drawing them in, Father. It's it's your patience. That's why you didn't arrive this morning. It's because you're bringing more people into your kingdom. Bring them in, please, Lord. We trust you with that. Father, for those who are tired this morning, exasperated, frustrated that you haven't come and made it right yet. I pray that you give them patience to live well. (laughs) This morning they just get a picture again of like, oh my goodness, yes, it'll be worth the wait. And so we'll wait. And then Father, I wanna pray for some people who you bring kind of to the end of themselves this morning. They believe in you, um, but they've settled for some sin. And now in the light of you returning, Oh, that sin looks like folly. I pray that you give them power to repent of that this morning and to turn. And so Holy Spirit, please have your way now as we sing, as we worship, as we go out into our weeks. Help us to be people who watch the sky. People who refuse to settle for the things of this world. People who cannot wait for our lips to touch that distant shore and who live permanently with that image in our mind while we wait. Make us patient, Lord, thanks for your patience. And so friends, just now, just, just before we sing, I would just say, maybe just take a minute to ask the Holy Spirit to just reveal to you. And God intersects our lives, he redirects our paths. Ask him, hey Lord, in light of this, which areas of my life currently don't make sense? Take those to him. He'll steer you and guide you. And then we sing. We sing certain of that great day.